just a quick mention here. This is not the section that I'll be focusing on, but in verse 12 there it says, That day Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this they had been enemies. What a weird way, or a weird little side note there. Deciding the fate, death penalty of an innocent man, that's when they became buddies. It's a weird side note. <laughs> Anyway, so that passage I wanted to have read. So we're moving into the Easter season. We're going to be focusing on uh, a little later section in that same chapter, but I wanted that as kind of some background to remind us of what's happening before we move into the section that I'm actually speaking on. We've all heard the saying, famous last words. I've got a few actual famous last words here, and I thought I'd, I'd start with some lighthearted ones. As lighthearted as, as last words can get. <laughs> uh, so Bob Hope, who was a famous comedian, maybe one of the most successful comedians of all time, when his, uh, his wife asked him where he wanted to be buried, Bob Hope said, surprise me. There was a general in the Union Army who on the battlefield, his name was John Sedgwick, said, well, they couldn't hit an elephant at this dis, and then was reportedly shot mid-sentence. <laughs> on the field. Henrik Ibsen was a playwright. His wife said to him, you're starting to look better. And his last words were on the contrary. <laughs> if I tell you that I'm gonna tell you someone's last words, people usually pay attention because last words mean something, they're important. If you knew that you were going to die and you had time to think about it, what would you want your last words to be? A lot of ideas go through my head. As I was looking through the long list of people's last words, a lot of them were words of love to their wife. I think that, that was beautiful as I read through many of those. I can bet what it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be something unimportant or minor. If you had a chance to think it through, you'd probably want to say something meaningful. And so this year, as we go into the Easter season, we're going to be looking at Jesus' last words before he died on the cross. Now, technically, of course, they're not his last words, because we know he arose again on the third day. But these are his last words on the cross. There are seven things Jesus said while he hung on that cross. They were not by accident. They were not thoughtless. And we know for a fact that Jesus knew long beforehand that he was going to be crucified. So he must have had a long time to think about it. Worth looking at chapter 23 of Luke, but just five chapters earlier in Luke 18, starting at verse 31, Jesus had taken his disciples aside and he had said to them, verses 31 and 30 to 33, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He's talking about himself. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. That is about as exact a prediction as Jesus could have given about exactly what happened to him and how he died on the cross. So he knew exactly what was going to happen. And he planned out what he's going to say. I have no doubt. So over the next few weeks, we're going to look at those words of Jesus on the cross. Words that he thought were important enough to speak in that moment. And words that the Holy Spirit inspired the gospel writers to record for all of us. And we're going to talk about what we can learn from those, how those apply in our lives. And we're going to look today at those first words that he had from the cross. So remember what Jesus had already gone through in that previous number of hours, less than a day. He had been in the Garden of Gethsemane and soldiers had come to take him, I'm sure not gently. He had been betrayed by one of his, close, his closest 12 disciples. And I'm sure, you know, Jesus obviously knew ahead of time that Judas was going to betray him. He knew it was going to be Judas. But I'm sure that didn't fully take away the sting of being betrayed by someone who he had spent almost every day with for years. And then despite being an innocent man, he had gone through multiple trials, never being set free. He'd had crowds that should have been worshiping him, instead mocking him, crying out for his blood. And that was the best part of his day. It went worse from there. 
After that, he was mocked and humiliated and severely beaten by soldiers. He was beaten so severely, in fact, that the scriptures tell us he couldn't even carry his own cross to the point of crucifixion, as they tried to get him to do. And then lastly, of course, and worst of all, he was crucified. What would you have prayed for after all of that? There's no doubt he was in more pain than I think most of us can ever properly imagine. Suffering horribly. There were spectators there watching him. There's soldiers there divvying up his meager possessions between them. What do you pray for in a situation like that? What do you say? Jesus could have prayed for anything. He could have prayed for the pain to stop. He could have prayed for legions of angels to come, take him down off the cross. Instead, we see in in Luke 23, verse 34, it says, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. That's the NIV, or if you're like me and you remember, memorize the old King James. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So on the cross, in pain, in suffering, still being mocked, Jesus' thoughts still aren't for himself. He's thinking about the people who are killing them, killing him. He's thinking about wanting them to be forgiven. He's thinking and he prays for that one thing that mankind needs more desperately than anything else, God's forgiveness. As he's dying on the cross, he prays for those killing him. He's asking for, I can assume he's asking for forgiveness for the soldiers who took him, for forgiveness for Pilate who eventually gave in to a bloodthirsty crowd. He's praying for forgiveness for soldiers who mocked him and spit on him. And let's stop and think for a minute about what that kind of love and forgiveness takes to have. Because, I mean, in a way, we could be dismissive and just say, well, he's Jesus. Of course, Jesus is going to forgive people. But we can't, we can't just let it pass so quickly. We can't be so dismissive and take for granted how much love, how full his heart must have been with love to be in that circumstance and still have grace and mercy on his mind. There's a saying that maybe you've heard before, and I couldn't find it online who had originally said it, but it said it wasn't nails that kept Jesus on the cross. It was love. And I think that's 100% true. We were talking about the same Jesus who had brought people back to life, who had walked on water, who had done many other miracles. If he had wanted to, I'm sure that he had the power to step right off the cross. But then prophecy would not have been fulfilled. The plan of salvation would not have been fulfilled. Matthew 26, 53 to 54 also makes it clear. He could have come off that cross any time that he wanted. Because when when the soldiers first came for him, And one of the disciples, we read in another gospel, that it was Peter, stepped up with a sword and tried to defend Jesus. Jesus stopped him. And in verses 53 and 54 of Matthew 26, he says, Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? There was one way for salvation to happen. I'm sure if there was another way, Jesus would have happily taken it. If there was another way for us to be saved, if there was any other way other than Jesus Christ, anyone else that we could call on for salvation, I'm sure Jesus would have happily not gone to the cross. But he had to. He said, this is the way it has to be fulfilled. And he said he could have called down 12 legions of angels. and A legion usually was roughly 5,000 men. So if we go by those numbers, Jesus just off the top of his head is saying he could call down more than 60,000 angels. And he would have been perfectly justified in doing it. This was one of the greatest sins mankind has ever committed. Let me rephrase that. It is the greatest sin mankind has ever committed. And he would have been perfectly justified in calling down legions of angels and wiping out everyone that put him on that cross. But again, he was thinking of us. He was thinking of salvation. He was even thinking of forgiveness of even the people there. He died so we could have forgiveness, period. And one of the things that I think is a defining mark about our faith 
how we, one of the ways that we can measure our faith by is when we're going through the Bible, when we're, when we're looking at scripture and we come across something that we disagree with, how do we react to that? And this comes to my mind right now because one of my difficulties with scripture is that it tells us that we're not supposed to uh, seek vengeance. We're not supposed to be physically harming other people. And my gut instinct, the natural instinct that I was born with, and obviously not all of our natural instincts are good and godly. My natural instinct says, if somebody tries to hurt me or someone tries to hurt my family, then I have every right to physically decimate them. (laughs) That's my gut instinct. But the scriptures say that's wrong. And I think one of the ways we can measure our faith is when you disagree with scripture, do you really believe it's the word of God? Do you say, well, then I must be wrong, even though my gut says otherwise? And do you submit to what the scriptures say? And I have to look at Jesus here on the cross and kind of see the irony there, because the reality is those men might have put Jesus physically on the cross, but the Bible makes it very clear that is the sin of all of us is why he had to go to the cross. And so if Jesus were going with my instinct, he would not have been thinking forgiveness and mercy. He would have been thinking in anger. And I thank God that his grace and mercy and love and forgiveness is so much greater than I can imagine. Let me do a quick side tangent here. It's it's important related to the text, but it's a bit of a side track. One of the things that I think it's significant to know is uh, this is this line where Jesus is praying for forgiveness is what's called a textual variant. So that means if you're looking in your in your Bibles, it might even be on there on your apps. I don't know, but it'll be in the physical Bibles. There'll be a little footnote saying in some of the oldest manuscripts, this line does not appear. And so I mention that because. First of all, I'll talk about why I think we can be, feel confident that it should be there. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second, but I bring it up because uh, I think it's important to know and understand how the scriptures came to us and understand why sometimes there might be a footnote that says something like that. So let me first say, though, this is not my expertise. I did take there was a a class about understanding different manuscripts and and textual variants in seminary, but it was one of my hardest classes other than Hebrew. (laughs) But basically what this is saying is, so when we, when we think about how we got the Bible, we have thousands and thousands, I believe it's over 24,000 different uh, ancient manuscripts that we have. And so what that means is the English Bible that we have now that was translated from, well, the New Testament we'll go with for, for now is, was translated from Greek, the Old Testament from Hebrew. And it was translated through all those different manuscripts. And so sometimes in those ancient manuscripts, there were little differences. In 99 point whatever percent of them, it was just like two words were switched or there was a different spelling of somebody's name. But there's certain ones like this where in some of the ancient manuscripts, that line's not there. And so I think it's important to know that because uh, I've, I've known people who grew up in church and they were never taught about these kinds of things. And so when they encountered them, it was by an atheist saying, you can't trust what the Bible says. And it really hurt their faith. Some of them gave up on the faith. So I want you to know that those exist. We're aware of it. And we still trust in the scriptures and we know why those things have happened. So let me put that out there. And then I wanted to say why I think it fits. First of all, Jesus praying for forgiveness for those who put him on the cross and for all of us for whose sin he had to go to the cross. It fits Jesus' own teaching, where Jesus said to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. It fits uh, Stephen in the book of Acts, who do follow Jesus' example. We see in Acts chapter seven, verse 59, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he fell asleep. I think he was following Jesus' example there. Um, And it also fulfills prophecy. Isaiah 53, 12 says, He bore the sin of many and made intercession for their transgressions, transgressions, which I think he was doing right here while he was on the cross even. So throughout his ministry, Jesus had repeatedly taught and emphasized 
that we need to be loving and forgiving. We need to forgive others. And now even freshly on the cross, he models that. He shows us what that looks like in the most powerful way possible. Matthew 5, verse 44, Jesus said, But I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Earlier in that same chapter, Matthew 5, 21 to 22, again, Jesus teaching on forgiveness. Peter had asked Jesus, how many times must I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Seven was in there in the Jewish, in the Hebrew culture. It was the number of completion because Jesus had created the world in seven days. It was like a number of perfection and wholeness represented. So if I forgive somebody seven times, surely that must be enough. And Jesus had said, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Or some translations say seven times 70. Either way, a lot of times. <laughs> And so again, we see on the cross here, Jesus showing us what real forgiveness looks like. A forgiveness that I think we can only ever really aspire to. Jesus even taught in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. In the middle of the Lord's Prayer, it says, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, or forgive us our trespasses as we, for as we forgive those who trespass against us. So in other words, Jesus says, not only is forgiving important, and not only did he model it for us, but Jesus said, if we're going to expect forgiveness from God, we need to be giving it to other people. We can't just claim something for ourselves. We're not willing to give to others. And then I think we also need to, as Christians, be aware that it's also our responsibility not just to give forgiveness, but to think of the opposite side of that coin. As Christians, forgiveness should be a defining trait for us as we follow Jesus' footsteps. But the other side of that coin is we need to be willing to ask forgiveness when we've done something wrong. We need to confess that sin to somebody that we've wronged. They go hand in hand. And this is, just a, a side note, this is something where the Catholic Church gets it wrong. The Catholic Church says we're supposed to confess our sins to a priest. Well, no, primarily, of course, we confess our sins to God. But when the scriptures talk about confess your sins to one another, this is what it's talking about. When you have sinned against someone, as a Christian, we need to be able to humble ourselves enough to ask for their forgiveness. That goes hand in hand. Not just to be able to forgive where we're in the position of being right, but where we have the humility to ask forgiveness when we've done, some, done something wrong. And when Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. I think he was stating the fact that those people did not understand what they were doing. They were crucifying Jesus Christ, their Messiah, their Savior, their Creator. Jesus Christ, God made man. The greatest sin mankind has ever been guilty of. And then it continues on in verse 35 of Luke 23. They divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people st stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. And I can only think of also the humility that Jesus had on the cross to endure all that. If you, are, if you know for a fact that you're perfectly in the right and there are people against you, people mocking you, how much is your instinct? Maybe, again, this is more for me and that, that uh, attitude I need to get over of anger or vengeance. But how much does it cry out in you to speak up and say, no, I'm the, I'm the one in the right here. <laughs> what you guys are doing is wrong. And Jesus doesn't hang on the cross and accuse he forgives. Part of the suffering of crucifixion, by the way, along with all the obvious of the nails through the hands and the feet, part of the suffering of crucifixion was that you died by suffocation. So when someone was hanging on the cross with their arms up, the way that they hung, your, your chest would go down. It made it hard to breathe. And so you'd have to push yourself up to take a breath. 
because of the pressure of hanging there. And so I think that makes it all the more powerful when we realize that Jesus used some of those last breaths, some of those hard, fought for last breaths to pray for forgiveness of even those who were crucifying him. And I think that should remind us of many things. It should remind us what our salvation cost. Salvation was not something simple to achieve. It's simple to receive it when we come in faith, but it costs something of infinite value to achieve it. It should remind us how much God really loves us and how far God was willing to go for that love. That he would send his own son to die for our sins. And then lastly, it should remind us of how awful our sin really is. That we should never think of it as something small or take it lightly. Every one of our sins paid for on the cross. Every one of our sins also making the cross necessary. Our sin is no small matter. <clears throat> and because of that, after that and because after that crucifixion, Jesus rose again, we can know that all of us too, who are his followers, will one day rise again. He died for our sins, and his rising is proof that we too, if we've put our faith in him, will one day rise. I started with some last words, so let me finish with some last words as well. John Wesley, a famous theologian from the 1700s, his last words his wife said were this. He said, the best of all is, God is with us. That's beautiful. If Jesus would say such kind words to those even who were killing him, just imagine what he'll say to us after this life is done when we come to him as one of his children as people who came to him in faith. Let's thank God for that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for salvation. We thank you for your love, which is overwhelming and even hard to comprehend how far you were willing to go for your love for us. Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ, who was willing to die for our sins, willing to go so far to make salvation possible for each one of us, taking the punishment for all of our sins on himself. Lord, I pray for everyone here that you would use this passage as encouragement and as a reminder. In Jesus' name, amen.